hello John, hello Soren, and hello everyone in the community. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm originally from Iran, but uh, I live in uh, Switzerland, Geneva. So to give you a little bit of background, <coughs> Uh, I was exposed to the MBSR course um, seven years back at my workplace. And since then I was doing that a little bit on and off. But then uh, since almost two years back, I started doing that more regularly. And last year I started uh, an academic course, actually program in the Bangor University as the part of oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> master's program in mindfulness, and I'm doing that. And then uh, this community actually, and uh, this retreat was really a great opportunity to feel belonging and interconnectedness to the whole community, which is a great advantage. So I have actually a question um, on your definition, John. You call it operational definition of mindfulness on non-judgmentally part of that. Because I was also, I myself wonders, and when I also ask that question. I'm not, start, o start over again, uh, Ahmad, because your voice just started to break up when you started saying <clears throat> the, the question. Oh. Yeah, so my question is about your uh, operational definition of uh, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And that's on the part of uh, non judgmentally. So, of course, uh, we all make meaning out of all the inputs, sensory inputs that we get. So, we're always doing judging and meaning cases. So. So I had a bit of difficulty understanding that non-judgmental part of it. So how that's possible. And a few days ago, actually, when I saw the documentary uh, uh, of uh, my year of living mindfully, actually, you were interviewed and you were saying that that's the kicker. And by non-judgmentally, you refer to not judging our judging that comes. So it sort of added another layer to that. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, for you, please to elaborate a little bit on that part, on that non-judgmentally part. And uh, because still I can see the judging comes. Uh, okay, well, more. listen, I, I get it. Um, and I'm so glad you asked this question because a lot of people <clears throat> have trouble with uh, that and they also think that non judgmental means that uh, you're unethical. It's okay to be unethical, that you know, someone's killing somebody else. Well, I mean, I'm breathe in, breathe out, I don't care. And it doesn't have anything to do with that. The reason I articulated the working definition, the operational definition, that way is it's like a Zen koan. So it's not like going to tell you exactly what it is. It's going to require you to go through exactly the process that you're going through, but you can't go through it merely with thinking because thinking will never penetrate the thing. So um, <clears throat> first of all, what it, what it means is that to be non-judgmental and to not judge all the judging means that you're going to have plenty of judgments. You sit down, take your seat. We've all seen it for the past 13 weeks, uh, 12 weeks. You sit down, you say, I'm not going to have any judgments. And, you know, everything's a judgment. I like this. I don't like that. It's easy, too long. He's talking too much. He's not talking enough. I mean, you know, I'm uncomfortable. My back hurts, whatever it is. And it's like, it's always, you know, judging, 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 judging. So, what it's really inviting us to do is notice how judgmental we are and then not judge that and then let go. So judging in my vocabulary is like um, a binary. It's zero and one. Liking, don't like. Like, don't like. Black, white. Want, don't want. 
Okay, that's what like a judgings are. I make a distinction between judging and discerning. Discernment is a kind of clear cl clarity around all sorts of shades of um, black and white, you know, all sorts of gray, you know, all sorts of nuance around um, how children behave or what people do to each other, or all of that kind of stuff, so that we don't fall into a dualism of this is good, this is bad, zero, one. Do you know what I'm saying? Because that way we dehumanize each other and we can even dehumanize ourselves. So the invitation behind that working definition, so to speak, or operational definition, is to really cultivate discernment and around every aspect of the nature of one's own mind and what it produces in thoughts, sensations, impulses, consciousness, the whole range of human experience, and not build any kind of narrative around it at all. Okay, but to see, to discern suffering and the causes of suffering from uh, somebody during the past few weeks used the term sukha, you know, as opposed to dukkha. So the the sort of sweetness or the beauty uh, or the the the, the non-suffering nature, you know, uh, of uh, reality. So that's uh, it's a it's a very very big definition, but it's something that if you only think about the words, uh, you'll you'll find all sorts of reasons to not like it, and you'll also say, well, if I'm not judgmental, then it is okay for people to do bad things to other people, and I should just breathe in, breathe out, and let go. And that's not, well, of course, what it says at all, and. It's one of the reasons that we're emphasizing over and over and over again that the cardinal principle is to first do no harm and to actually recognize how much harm we do. Even in our own minds, we're creating harm to ourselves and others, never mind our actions out in the world. So I, I can't thank you enough, Ahmad, for raising your hand and somehow getting chosen by, by Soren because... Um, well, this is the power of a koan is that, you know, um, it really, there's a whole universe in there about what is the nature of mindfulness. And I didn't want that universe to be collapsed by cognitive theorists or cognitive therapists so that it's just one more thing that you operationalize in a linear way and then you do it to or on your clients who I would call victims or something like that, rather than engaging in the love affair itself. And this is an art form, and there's no one right way to do it. It has to come through you as the student, and I'm sure that the people in Bangor are uh, teaching it that way, uh, because, you know, they, they um, it's coming from a very deep place uh, in those folks. I know that because I know many of them personally. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Did that satisfy you? I mean, does that respond to your concerns or the reason for asking the question? Yes. Uh, basically, when I explain it, and then I can see there is a layer to that, so which is not in the, or at least I don't see it in the first, like, one sentence definition of mindfulness. So it's basically, it says non-judging our judgment or knowing our judging and then trying to be non-judgmental. Yeah, it, it's meant to be prov provocative because we're mm. talking about the Dharma. Mm. It's, it's infinitely profound. And uh, clinical psychologists and other health professionals tend to want to have like um, very linear, easy to understand definitions. And the trouble is you can't understand mindfulness with your thinking mind, no matter how smart you are, no matter how great a scientist you are. And so that definition is really meant, and it's one reason why a lot of people criticize me for it, because they don't actually understand that it's a koan and that you cannot get it by thinking about it. You have to actually practice and let it do you, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks so much.
Thank you. Yeah.